awesome. <laughs> All right, well, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, so this is our second week and uh, we are gonna try to get through the Old Testament. Uh, we may not, because we're gonna have to spend a little time in discussion, but that's okay. We're gonna have to go a little bit quicker than we get last week. Uh, we only did 11 chapters of the first book of the Bible. We have to now do the rest of the Old Testament. So we'll have to go a little bit quicker. Uh, so last week, we, we talked about how God's design and creation was for, uh, was for humans to experience his rest by enjoying his creation through perfect relationships. That he wanted them to enjoy perfect relationships with himself, with other people, and with his creation. And God's attention was to dwell on the earth among his people. He created the world as his, as his dwelling place. He wanted to dwell with us. But the problem was Adam and Eve rebelled against God, sin entered the world, and these perfect relationships were ruined. And as a result, humans faced the, faced consequences and judgment for sin. And uh, the, the worst consequences were death, spiritual death, separation from God, and then eventually physical death. And because of the sin... Um, and because God is holy, he was no longer able to dwell among his people. The earth was not going to be his dwelling place. But thankfully, that was not the end of the story. It was actually the beginning of God's great redemptive plan. And when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, it seemed like everything was lost. You know, this should be the end. Everything's ruined. It's not the way it's supposed to be. But God wasn't surprised by the fall, by, by their sin. God is in complete control. He knew this was going to happen. And before creation, God knew that Adam and Eve would sin. And so before creation, before he even created them, he had a plan to put the world right and to call people back to him through Jesus. It's, it is his eternal plan. And so in Genesis, we're at the start of the story. And so the ending and, you know, the good news and, and how everything kind of wraps itself up and is restored, it's still a long way off. We still have to go through a lot more books of the Bible. But even in Genesis, in the midst of that dark, dark and horrible moment when Adam and Eve sinned, there are moments of light. We see the beginning of God's rescue plan and his promises to bring salvation. Uh, in the aftermath of humanity's sin, God judges them and and that's that in chapter three of genesis it's all the curses you know work's going to be hard women your pain and childbirth is going to be a lot worse and it's all these bad things happening he's judging them but amazingly at the same time god shows grace to adam and eve and this is another major theme we're going to see throughout the bible this idea of grace that yes god is holy yes he must deal with sin he must judge sin and and punish it but God is also full of grace. God is loving and merciful and compassionate. And he loves his people and wants them to know him. And so in the garden, Adam and Eve are judged by being expelled by the garden. They're kicked out of the garden, separated from God, separated from the tree of life. They're now going to experience spiritual and physical death. But God also shows them grace in that moment. What's interesting is Adam and Eve, when they sin, they kind of hide from God. They're naked, they're ashamed, and, God, and yet God seeks them out. He, he comes looking for them, even though they rebelled against him. He provides clothes to hide their nakedness. And most importantly, God promises that a savior is going to come. In Genesis 3.15, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's speaking to the serpent, the one who had deceived Adam and Eve. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your he he heel, head, sorry. He shall, yeah, he shall bruise your head or crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. What this prophecy is saying is that one day, Eve will have a son, a son of Eve, a, a human being is going to come and he is going to destroy the evil one. And, and with the evil one, all the consequences of sin, everything that sin destroyed and ruined and has caused, he is going to destroy and, and, and restore and renew. He's going to be the serpent crusher. This, this wounded victor, this idea that he's going to win, but somehow in winning, he's going to get hurt. He's going to get wounded. The serpent's going to bite his heel. Something bad's going to happen to him, but ultimately it'll bring about victory. He will save God's people, restoring all that is lost. 
Of course, this is a, uh, a prophecy about Jesus. God, even in the garden, thousands of years before Jesus came, was saying that Jesus is going to come to save the world. And so we have this moment of grace. But of course, we also know that in the following chapters, sin grows and spread as, as humanity, as population grows. Sin doesn't stop. It, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And then in Genesis 12, the story kind of changes. The scene kind of shifts. And we see the next stage of God's grace and his rescue plan. God is now going to work through a man and his family to bring about his redemption. And God speaks to a man named Abram, and, and soon he's going to be renamed Abraham. And he makes these incredible promises to Abraham. And these promises really set the agenda for the rest of the biblical story. These promises God makes to him are really about everything that's going to happen after them come back to these promises. They're the seed of the gospel. They contain the seed of the gospel, the, the good news of God's salvation that's coming. And, and what happens is the seed is kind of planted here. And then over time, throughout the rest of the Old Testament, it grows and is more and more is revealed about how God is going to restore and fulfill these promises and kind of bring everything back to what had been lost in the garden. The rest of the Old Testament is all about how these kind of work themselves out. God begins to show more and more pieces of, of his plan as he goes along until we hit the New Testament and it's fulfilled by Jesus. Now, there's nothing special about Abraham. Uh, he's not chosen because of his goodness, because he's a great guy, because he's the perfect choice for God to use. It's all about God's grace. That's why God chooses Abraham. And actually, later in the story, we see that Abraham's actually a really unlikely and unexpected choice for God to fulfill his promises through. It's actually, from our perspective, a bad choice to fulfill God's promises through. And we're reminded in the story of Abraham that God doesn't choose us or save us because of our goodness or because of how great we are or because of what we can do for him. We're saved by grace. It's totally his work. And God doesn't choose to use us because we're, we're these great people who have so much to offer him and we could help him. No, he uses weak, flawed, and unlikely people like you and me so that God's strength and greatness will be seen. So that when everything happens and everything turns out right and the problem is solved and something great happens, everyone will look at the person who did it and go, they couldn't have done it. It must have been God. So God gets the glory. And so in the biblical story, the heroes aren't the Bible characters. The heroes aren't Abraham or Moses or David or, or Paul in the New Testament. They're not the heroes of the story. They're, they're the secondary actors. There's only one hero, and it's God. The story is all about him and how he brings about his plans and purposes, how he accomplishes what he wants done. It's about him. In Genesis chapter 12, God makes a covenant with Abraham. Now, covenants are found throughout the Bible, um, particularly in, in the Old Testament. And God works through covenants to bring about his plans and purposes. And a covenant is a solemn commitment. God commits himself to his people by making binding promises. It's really a covenant at the heart of it is a promise. And we think about today, the best example is the covenant of marriage. That's really the only one we would even think about or use nowadays. This idea, and you know, you get up there and you give your vows to one another. You make promises to one another. This is what God does with people and then with, with, with nations. And these binding promises are often sealed in blood. And they're given with a sign, they're, they're, they're a sign, something to be a reminder of them. Um, he makes a covenant with Noah, and the sign of that covenant is the rainbow. So he shows them, whenever you see the rainbow, be reminded that it will never flood, destroy the earth by flooding it again. So this, throughout, the, throughout the Old Testament, he's making covenants with people. So in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, God says to Abram this, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house, to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
There are three main promises to Abraham in this, in this passage. First, God is going to make Abraham's descendants into a great nation. They are going to be God's people. And the sign for this is circumcision. Uh, and Abraham's descendants, they're going to have a special relationship with God. They're going to be his people. And they're going to be numerous. There's going to be lots of them. They're going to be a great nation. And this idea of the special relationship is, is frequently repeated. This promise that continues, God uh, repeats this promise multiple times in the Old Testament. And he uses the covenant refrain, I will be your God and you will be my people. He keeps saying this to them as a reminder, they are his people. I'm your God, you're my people. You have a special relationship with me. I'm making you into a great nation. The second promise is Abraham is promised land. Abraham is commanded to leave his homeland and go to the land that God will show him. And he is promised the land of Canaan. Um, this is, you know, we call this, you know, the promised land. This is how it's often referred to in the Old Testament. This piece of property is, is, is really key to what God wants to do with his people. Finally, God promises to bless Abraham and his family. And the curse of the fall is now being replaced by the blessing of salvation. Abraham and his descendants will be blessed. And what's interesting, though, in this, in this promise is that his saving purposes are not limited to just Abraham and his descendants, his family alone. God tells Abraham that through him, all peoples on earth will be blessed. Everything God will do for Abraham and his descendants isn't just for them. It's not just about what God wants to do through them and for them. It's actually part of his plan to save all the nations. He is going to use them to bless everyone else and bring salvation to everybody else in the world. Now, these are some incredible promises that when they were told to Abraham seemed, I, I'm sure in his mind, he must have thought, how could these ever happen? And yet Abraham believes them. He believes these promises from God, and the Bible tells us it's credited to him as righteousness. Abraham is accepted by God because of his faith in God's promises. He's saved because of his faith. We, come, we use the term justification by faith. He, he's saved. God accepts him. He finds salvation because he puts his faith in God by believing these promises. Now, the central promise to Abraham is that God is going to make him into a great nation. He tells Abraham at night, I want you to go outside, look up into the star, sky. And he says, look at all the stars. You see how many there are, count them. And he says, you will have as many descendants as there are stars in the sky. You're going to have a lot, you know, this is going to be a great numerical people. And then most importantly that, this savior, this serpent crusher, this wounded victor, this someone who's going to come to save everyone, he's going to come from Abraham's line. He's coming from his family. He's an Abraham's descendant. What's interesting, though, is almost immediately this promise that he's going to have lots of descendants is in jeopardy. You see, Abraham has no children. And, that, and not just that, he's old. Him and his wife are old. They're past the childbearing age. They can't have children. I mean, how can Abraham's descendants become a great nation if they, he doesn't even have a son? He doesn't even have one child. How, how will his line even continue? There, there's really, it seems like this is a bad choice. Like why, why would God pick Abraham, this old guy with an old wife and no children? Like weren't there a bunch of other people around who already had lots of kids? You know, there's gotta be some homeschooling families around that we could have picked someone from and, you know, that's okay. I'm home, I, my kids are homeschooled. I'm allowed to make jokes like that. Uh, you know, like, why is, he, why is he picking this old man with no kids? And yet the reason is, the in, God, or Abraham's inability to have a son shows that only God can fulfill his promises. Okay, it's not about Abraham taking matters into his own hands, which he tries, and, and God goes, nope, nope, that's not, that wasn't my intention. And even for us, it's, it's, it's not about us trying to fulfilling God's promises, what we can do. It's all about God will fulfill his promises. If he promised something, 
He will bring it about in his timing, in his way. And this is the story through the rest of the Old Testament. God makes promises, and then he fulfills them. And he is not dependent on anyone to do this. And sure enough, God does the impossible. He brings about a miracle. It's miraculous. It's supernatural. Abraham has a son, Isaac. Well, Isaac grows up, and he, he marries a woman named Rebecca. And they have two sons, Esau and Jacob, twins. And uh, they're rambunctious boys. It actually says that they fight in the womb, which must have been horrible for Rebecca. And uh, what's interesting, though, is once again, God works through an unexpected choice. Esau's older. He should, uh, God's blessing, God's covenant promise should go through him. You know, that's the way it's supposed to work. You're firstborn, the line of the promise goes through you. The covenant promises, you know, your family will continue on everything. But what's interesting is Jacob, the younger son, is the one who receives the blessing of the firstborn. And again, he's a horrible choice. He's a trickster. He steals his brother's blessing. He's a little bit of a mama's boy. Uh, he runs away. He seems to just run away when he gets into trouble. It just, you know, it's like, God, why are you picking this guy? Esau kind of seems like a better choice. He's like a man's man. He's strong. You know, he's a leader. And yet God chooses Jacob. Again, grace. God doesn't always choose the, like, the, the best, what we think is the best choice. Jacob's line becomes the line of the blessing. His descendants will become the people of God. And Jacob has 12 sons. And the second youngest son, Joseph, is his favorite. Well, his older brothers are jealous of him, of course. And so they sell him into slavery. And Joseph ends up in Egypt. But God is with him even there. And he raises Joseph up to become Pharaoh's right-hand man, second in the kingdom. And because of that, Joseph is in a position to help his family when they experience a famine. Now, there's a famine in the land, and uh, even back in Canaan, where, where his family is, and this famine endangers the future of the gospel. You know, it threatens to kill off the family line because of starvation. And, and, you know, it threatens to destroy Abraham's descendants before they become a great nation. And yet, because of where Joseph was, because he is now second in command in Egypt, he is now in a position to provide food to save his family. And once again, God is in complete control. God is going to bring about his promises. He's going to bring about his plans. And in Genesis 50, 20, Joseph says this to his brothers when they, they eventually reunite uh, at the end. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring, about, bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. God is able to use the, the great sin that was done towards Joseph, his innocent suffering. He sold him to slavery. He's later falsely accused and sent to prison. Horrible things happen to Joseph, and yet God is able to take that and use that to fulfill his promises, to provide salvation for Abraham's descendants. If Joseph hadn't been sold into slavery and ended up in jail, he would never have been raised up to a position to be able to provide food to save his family, keeping Abraham's line going so that eventually, way down the line, Jesus could come and save everybody. God is bringing about his plans, often in ways we could never imagine. He is in control over all things. And that concludes the book of Genesis. So next we move into the book of Revelation. Or Revelation. <laughs> we're really going fast today. Woo! Next to Revelation. Thank you. We're done. Uh, <laughs> woo, I, got I got Revelation on my mind. That's like a, that's a little hint about stuff that might be coming down later if you're if you join us on Sundays. Uh, next, we move into the book of Exodus. And uh, Jacob and his family, they move to, to Egypt to be with Joseph, where they multiply. They're now becoming numerically great. You know, that, that, the, the promise that stars of the sky, this is beginning to happen. There's lots of them. But there's a problem. They're slaves. They're not a great nation. They're not even independent. They are slaves in Egypt. And, and quite a bit of time has passed now. Hundreds of years has passed. But God has not forgotten about them. He remembers his covenant. He remembers that he had promised that they would be his people. 
And so because he has promised that, God must act. He must save them so that they can belong to him. You know, he must uphold his name and do what he said he would do. And so the rescue operation begins with God appearing to Moses in a burning bush, this man, Moses. And uh, God tells Moses, go to Pharaoh and demand the release of my people. And then God promises that he will be with Moses and that he will act to rescue his people. And we see in this that God is the one who saves. Again, he fulfills his promises. Moses doesn't save the Israelites. He's not the one bringing them out, redeeming them, rescuing them from Pharaoh. God does. He's the hero. God always accomplishes what he says he will do. He's the one who does it. Again, he's in control. He's bringing about the purposes, the plans, the outcome he wants. The moment of salvation for the Israelites comes at Passover. God announces that he will kill all the firstborn sons in Egypt in one night. And he tells the Israelites, I will spare your sons if, they will, uh, if you kill a lamb and put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of your house. Uh, I wonder what uh, kids who were the firstborn, if they slept that night, what they thought about that night, if they, you know, went down to the, uh, to the door, you know, every few hours, is the blood still there? Is the blood still there? Dad, did you, did you, did you put the blood on the door? You know, you know, I'm the firstborn. I wonder what it was like that night. If there was, you know, a little, you know, angst uh, among some of the, some of the children in the Israelite homes. Well, sure enough, that night, God does what he said he would do, and all the Egyptian firstborn males die. But the Israelites survive because of the lamb, the blood of the lamb. And what we see in this Passover is that God saves by substitution. The Israelites, they deserve punishment just as much as the Egyptians. You know, they're not perfect. They're sinful. They're, they're you know, they, they, they do bad things too. But God saves them by providing a substitute to die in their place. The lamb for the firstborn son. Pharaoh then, at long last, lets the Israelites go free, but almost immediately changes his mind. He leads an army in pursuit of the Israelites. And the Israelites, they're trapped by the Red Sea. The army's coming for them. There's nowhere to go. But God again does the miraculous. He rescues his people. He parts the Red Sea. The Israelites cross to, through to escape to freedom. Pharaoh and his chariots follow after them. They think we got them now, but God causes the waters to crash on, down on them and they all drown. And so in this moment, we see salvation again, but it's salvation by conquest. God defeats Pharaoh. He defeats their enemies and they are saved as a result. And so in this moment, the Israelites are now out of Egypt, they've been redeemed, and we begin to now see the, the first promises to Abraham beginning to be fulfilled, at least partially. The Israelites are God's people. He's redeemed them, and they're becoming a great nation. They're free now. They're numerically great. They're becoming, and, and everything that God has said to Abraham is starting to come true. They're on their way to the promised land as well. Now, God's second great promise to Abraham was that he would bless them. And this begins to be partially fulfilled uh, in Israel's history through the giving of the law and God's presence among his people. After they cross the Red Sea, the Israelites go to Mount Sinai, and there God reveals his law to them in the Ten Commandments. Now, when we think about law, both you know, biblical law, but let's just say laws in general, Let's admit that we normally have a negative view towards law. Not too many of us like, well, we like laws for other people. We don't like maybe law as much for, for ourselves. We kind of have a negative view. It restricts my freedom. I don't like being told what to do. You know, I don't like to be controlled. Uh, let's admit there's uh, a lot of laws or rules right now with everything going on that we don't maybe enjoy following that much if we're honest with ourselves. So we generally have a negative view towards the law, but it is a good thing to be under the law of God. And now that the Israelites are God's people, they must live in a way that reflects God's character. They must live up to being his people. There are expectations if they are to be God's people, you know, and, and, and living um, 
in a way that reflects God's character. This is actually the best way to live. This is how God intended them to live. It's how he intended us to live. We're made in God's image, and, and we best reflect God's image. We best live up to that when we live how he intended us to live. We live God's way. We become who God wants us to be. And it's by following God's laws, his rules, the way that he is, the path he has given us to live, that's how we actually become more human. You know, the more that we live apart from God, the more that we live our own way independent, the more that the less we reflect God and the less we are actually human. To become truly human means to become more like God and to live, reflect him by following his commands. Now, God's law had a number of different functions uh, for the Israelites and then also for us. First, the law reveals our sin by convicting us of our disobedience. We see the law, we see what God would have us do, and we realize we don't live up to that standard. There's a long list and we go, uh -huh, I don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, I struggle with that. And so it reveals that we are at heart sinful people, that we are often disobedient towards God. It then reveals our need for a savior by pointing us to Jesus as the only one who fully obeyed the law on our behalf. He was perfect. He never sinned. He's the only person in history who fully obeyed God's law. But then he took the penalty for us breaking the law upon himself. He was perfect. And yet he was willing to take all the mistakes we've done, the penalty that we deserve because we don't follow God's law on himself. And then finally, the law reveals God's standards for how he would have us live. This is what we are supposed to live up to, who we are supposed to be. God's intention and desire also was to dwell among his people. And this begins, this was his goal back in Eden, and this begins now to be partially fulfilled among the Israelites. Now that the Israelites are God's people, now that they are living under his rule, uh, they are at least in part trying to uh, follow his law, they are able to again experience something of God's presence among him. him. That relationship that had been uh, severed, ruined, uh, distorted, is able to be now restored because they're becoming his people and they're, you know, living, beginning to live how he would have them live. In fact, the, the reason, the purpose that God redeemed the Israelites was so that they could have a relationship with him. That was the whole point. I'm going to save you out of, out of Egypt so that I can be your God and you can be my people and we can begin to move back towards Eden and have that perfect relationship that we were designed, you were designed to have. You were made to know me and so I'm bringing you out of Egypt so that you might know me. And so God instructs Moses to build a tent called the tabernacle. And in this tent, it's where God's presence dwells among them. This is a significant step towards the fulfillment of God's plan that the earth should be his dwelling place. He now has a place where he dwells among his people. And it is a blessing to have his presence among them. It's a blessing that God is in their camp in the desert. And in fact, the tabernacle was to be at the center of the camp and everyone camped around it. God's presence was to be at the center in the midst of who they are. It's a good thing. But it also presents a problem. You know, how can a holy God live among sinful people without destroying them? And God gives them again an answer. He gives them a way that they can meet with him, come before him in a, in a, in a limited way, sacrifice. And in the book of Leviticus, God institutes a system to deal with the problem of sin. The Israelites are to take an animal. They are to lay their hands on the animal and uh, actually confess their sins, what they have done wrong. And the animal is to represent them and their sins. The priest then kills the animal as a substitute for them, presents the blo their blood or the blood of the, the animal before God in the tabernacle. And so the animal dies in their place so that they can live. The penalty for sin is death. The animal dies instead of them. Their sins are atoned for it. They're covered. And now they are able to have a relationship with God. And so through the law and through the sacrificial system, the Israelites are beginning to experience some of the blessings of living in relationship with God. They're able to have this meeting with God, to know God in a, in a, in a, 
somewhat more personal way. And God is, you know, able to dwell among his people. But this is severely restricted. It's not perfect. In the tabernacle, the, the, the tabernacle and the tent of itself, there's this place called the holy place. And then there's a curtain. And on the other side of the curtain is another room called the holy of holies. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant is. That's really where God's presence dwells in the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies, and he could only enter it once a year. There's this still a separation, and the, the curtain represents that separation between God and the people. It is a limited relationship with God. We're getting closer to getting back to Eden. We're getting closer to having those perfect relationships, but we're still far from God's design and intention for his people. God's third promise to Abraham was to give him the land of Canaan. And the books of Numbers through Joshua tells about how this promise comes true. Uh, Numbers is a record of the Israelites' disobedience and the resulting delay in the fulfilling of this promise of the land of Canaan. Throughout the book of Numbers, the people grumble. They complain about everything, food and water and where they're going and who's in charge. And they, they rebel against God. It, it, it's, just, it's, it's just a mess. They reach the edge of the, the promised land and, and they say, well, let's scope it out. I mean, this is the land that God had promised Abraham hundreds of years before. They're about to finally enter the land. They're about to fulfill the promise. They send 12 spies in. And when they get back, 10 of the spies go, oh, man, we shouldn't go in there. There's giants and, and you know, there are fortified cities, and, and there's no way we can take the land. It, it's too dangerous. And the Israelites become terrified, and they refuse to enter the land. They won't go into it. And so because of their unbelief, God punishes them by saying that all those who refuse to enter, that generation, will die in the desert. And for the next 40 years, they wander around until this unbelieving generation dies. And then in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses gives a final sermon before the new generation enters the land. The next generation is now ready to enter the land. It's almost like a fresh start, second chance. And in, and in this sermon, in the book of Deuteronomy, there's a list of blessings and curses from God. And essentially, Moses' farewell address, because he's not going to enter the land with them, is really just a, it's a plea to them, telling them, don't make the same mistakes as the previous generation. Don't make the mistake that your fathers and grandfathers made about their unbelief and disobedience to God. He tells them in Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, and if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you, Today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. But then in verse 58, he says, If you are not careful to do all the words of the law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, you shall be plucked off the land that you're entering to take possession of it. Essentially, Moses tells them, If you obey, if you follow the law from God, you will be blessed. God's going to bless you. He's going to, you know, give you this great land of abundance. He's going to be with you. You're going to be his people. But if you disobey God, you will be cursed. Think about that your, your fathers and mothers and grandfathers and aunts and uncles, everyone, the first generation, they disobeyed and they were cursed. They didn't get to enter the land. The same thing will happen to you. You'll be cursed and you will lose the land. I will kick you out of the land like I'm about to do to the inhabitants in there right now. Joshua then succeeds Moses after he dies and he leads the Israelites into Canaan. And again, God fulfills his promises. God defeats the inhabitants and enables the Israelites to take possession of the land. Again, they're not really the ones winning the battles. It's God. And, and at times it's miraculous uh, things that happen that enable them to conquer and take possession of this land. And in this moment, God's kingdom is now established in part through the nation of Israel. They're living in the land. They're becoming a great nation. They've taken possession of it. They're, they're experiencing God's blessing. 
God's kingdom is beginning to be established in a real physical way through the nation of Israel. And we're left with a question. The, 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 the Israelites are, have this question. Will they keep the covenant and prosper? Or will they be disobedient and be expelled from the land? That's their choice. Moses, or Joshua kind of gives them this kind of choice at the end. Hey, are you going to serve God and experience his blessing and live in the land? Or are you going to be disobedient and you're going to be expelled from the land? And this is really the, the question that the rest of the Old Testament is about. This is what every generation of the Israelites kind of wrestle with. Are you going to obey God or disobey him? Are you going to live under his blessing or under his judgment? And as we see, this is a real struggle for the Israelites going forward. After Joshua dies, sure enough, the people rebelled. And in the book of Judges, there is a cycle of sin and grace. And the book of Judges is a series of stories, each about these different uh, judges or, or rulers in, in Israel. And everyone kind of follows the same cycle. Uh, Israel sins. They typically, they worship idols. They don't follow God's law. So God judges them. He often sends another nation in to invade them, conquer them, raid their land. The Israelites cry out to God for mercy, for help. So God provides a judge, a, a ruler, a, a hero, a savior to save them. The judge rescues the people. He restores peace to the land. There's typically peace for the rest of his lifetime. He dies and Israel sins again, and the cycle repeats itself again and again and again. And the end of Judges tells us what the problem is. It says, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And we see this kind of this idea that Israel needs a king. They, they need someone to rule over them, but, but to rule over them in a way that they uphold God's laws. They lead the people towards God. That there's naturally, there's a wayward tendency in us to live our own lives, to be independent, to do what is right in our own life. And they needed someone who would say, no, we are going to follow God's rule. Like someone God would rule through so that the people would not go astray. Then in the book of 1 Samuel, the Israelites ask for a king. And, and even though it, you know, God is hinting that they need a king, God is angry that they ask for a king because they have the wrong motivation. The Israelites want a king instead of God, not a king under God. They wanted to be like the surrounding nations. And, and in ancient times, the king was the ultimate authority. And the king was kind of the symbol of your country. So, you know, the greater your king, the greater you looked as a nation. He was, you know, the symbol of your might and power. He's a warrior. He's supposed to, you know, exemplify all those traits of greatness so that when people thought of, you know, the other nations, they would look at a, a country and go, look at that king. That nation is someone we should fear or, or be afraid of. Or look at that king. He's not much. I think we can take him. That's why they wanted a king. They wanted someone to, you know, protect them and, and represent them. When really that's what God was supposed to do. He was supposed to be their king. They didn't want a king under God as God intended. God's intention was that the king was to be God's man. He was su to submit first and foremost to God and uphold his law. He was supposed to read the law daily so that he could lead the people in following God. And through that, God's blessing would come as God ruled this kingdom through his king. But they wanted to be independent of God. That same old sin always seems to creep up. I don't need God. I want to go my own way. But God is gracious. He gives them a king, Saul. But Saul turns from God and God rejects him as king. And so Samuel anoints the boy David. And God's presence is with him. He will be a different king. And then in 2 Samuel, David becomes king after Saul dies. And David is able to establish peace and prosperity in Israel. God's kingdom is, is, is partially being established on earth now through the land of Israel, but also through the monarchy of David. It is a great time. David is, is, is for the most part, a great king. There is, you know, he's expanding the borders. They're actually really taking all the land God has promised him. They're defeating the enemies. There's prosperity. There's wealth in the land. The kingdom is really almost at its pinnacle in this moment. 
but it's not the complete fulfillment of God's kingdom. This isn't completely what God had envisioned for how his kingdom was to be. A greater king and kingdom is still to come. God promises David in 2 Samuel 7, 6, verse 16. He says to him, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. God makes a covenant with David. He says, your descendant will sit on the throne forever. It's going to be an everlasting throne. And really, it's almost hinting, though, at, at a kingdom that is over everything. This the everlasting kingdom, but almost a kingdom that's over all the world, too. His, and, and so the future of the covenant promises that began with Abraham, you know, they're growing now, are now dependent on one to come from David's line, this future king that's going to come. He's going to be the serpent crusher. He's going to be the one who's going to rule over everything and bring about God's kingdom and restore everything that had been lost. And he will be a descendant of David. In the book of 1 Kings, the next book, Solomon, David's son, becomes king over Israel. This is the golden age of, of the kingdom of Israel. We now reach its peak with Solomon. And there is kind of the question, is he the one we're waiting for? You know, God had promised that a son of David would be this one to kind of establish this great kingdom. Is, is it meant to be Solomon? Is God completely fulfilling his covenant promises right now through Solomon? And under Solomon, at times it seems maybe there's unprecedented peace and prosperity, more riches. There's no war. Solomon's not a warrior like David. And I mean, the wealth that is happening in there, uh, Solomon builds a glorious temple, which replaces the tabernacle. It's a permanent dwelling place of God. It's almost like a new Eden. In fact, the temple is decorated with floral designs, like uh, reliefs and carvings of flowers. It's meant to almost feel like the Garden of Eden in it. Again, that dwelling place of God. It's a, you know, a holy temple city is what Jerusalem, which was what God's intention was in, in the garden. But even then, access is still restrictive as it was in the tabernacle. You still can't come face to face with God. There's still the curtain between the Holy of Holies. This, so this is as good as it gets in Israel's uh, history. We're at the pinnacle. And it should have continued this way. All subsequent kings should have followed God as, their forf as David had. And, and it should have just gotten better and better and better as they lived under the, as the Israelites lived in the land. They submitted to God's rule. They followed his law. They enjoyed his blessing. And, and the kingdom expanded and all the nations around them looked at them and went, man, we want to know the God that you serve. And the whole world began to follow God and, and almost eat in the garden, expanded out. The kingdom would expand out until the whole world was this garden, holy garden city where God's presence dwelt among them. It should have been that way, but it's not. The kingdom at its peak, it doesn't last that long. Solomon eventually turns from God. He falls into idolatry. And God delays his judgment in this moment, but soon after the kingdom begins to fall apart. And so we're reminded that the true kingdom of God is still to come. This wasn't it. It was just a shadow of something greater and something better is coming. The, the, the king and the monarchy, or so the kingdom and the monarchy, they're pointing to something that's still to come that's even better than what they had at that peak moment with Solomon. We need a true savior. We need a better king to come to establish God's kingdom and bring about all the fulfillment of all his promises. So what we're going to do right now is uh, for the last, probably the last few minutes we, uh, we have, last you know, 15 minutes, is uh, talk a little bit about how we see Jesus in the Old Testament. And we've talked about a, a, quite a few events and promises and characters and all of them are, I keep hinting, they're a shadow. They're pointing to something that's greater, something better that's going to happen, which, of course, is Jesus. And so what I want to do in the last few minutes is look at some of these and talk about how can we actually see Jesus in the Old Testament? How do these um, events and promises, how does Jesus actually fulfill them? Because the whole Old Testament is about Jesus, and but it can be difficult at times. So uh, online is going to do it and uh, separately, and we're going to do it here. Essentially, I have a list of 
of events that we've already talked about tonight. And then I have uh, some verses in the New Testament that talk about how Jesus fulfills them or how they were pointing to Jesus. And we're going to kind of look them up. Uh, uh, each of you will kind of take one, look it up, and then we'll talk about from those how we can see Jesus in the Old Testament, how he fulfills them. Okay, excellent. So if you look in the box on the, uh, the chat box, you'll see uh, Mark's first uh, question. How are promise events and characters in the Old Testament foreshadowing the, and pointing to Jesus? How does Jesus fulfill the Old Testament promise to Abraham that through him all nations will be blessed? Genesis chapter 22, verse 18 and then he gives us Galatians chapter 3, verse 14 and 16. So if you want to look those up, and then we will chat about that question. Could you repeat the, the uh, scriptures, please? I can. Uh, once again, Genesis, Genesis 18. 22, 18. Pardon? Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. Okay. And then Galatians chapter 3, verse 14 and 16. If you click on the chat box, I'll be putting these things in the chat box. Where is the chat box? <laughs> so if, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see the word mute, stop video, security, participants, and chat. Do you see that? Um, might be in more. It could be depending upon your settings. Okay, chat. Yep. So if you'll yep. click that, then you'll see I have already put that question in. Oh, okay. Box. Thank you. So I'll be putting all of these in there one at a time so you can see the scriptures. So go ahead and read those. And you're more than welcome to unmute your mic at this point, particularly when you get ready, you want to share something or you want to ask something. Even before seeing the verses, the story of uh, Abraham and Isaac came to mind as far as God providing the lamb. And mm -hmm. just what Abraham would have gone through thinking about sacrificing a son and preparing for that for the three-day journey and how hard that would have been. And then we have basically the same parallel story in the New Testament with Jesus. Uh, well, that one came to mind even before seeing the verses. Correct. So if you read, <coughs> if you're at the Galatians passage now, read that one really carefully because... This also teaches a hermeneutical principle as well, uh, that the ability to interpret scripture. Pastor Dan? Yes, ma'am. For us lay people, could you explain that big word you just said? Her hermeneutic. I'm asking for a friend. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> the, the, the term hermeneutics is the art and science of scripture interpretation. That's what I thought. How do you properly <laughs> interpret scripture? Okay. Uh, 
we, 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 we do it every day. We just don't know what the word behind it is. Okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me, what does this passage, how do we connect this passage to the Old Testament is really what Mark is asking us. Well, the seed that uh, is promised to be the Savior is coming through Abraham. But in Galatians, it says that it's just to the one seed. In other words, it's only Christ. It's only going to be one person, ultimately, that ends up yeah. being the Savior. Yeah. yeah. And, and so just as a, the principle of hermeneutics or interpretation, if you're reading this passage... Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham. What would you want to do? You want to go back and read those promises because the author is assuming they know them and that that's already in their mind. Well, if that's not in our minds and we need to go back and read those promises, what was promised to Abraham? <coughs> Daughter's cooking something. All of a sudden, it got choking here. Um, <coughs> He'd be a great nation. He'd be blessed. And all nations of the world, we'd be blessed through him. Those are the promises then that Galatians is, is saying still are coming through Christ. Okay? So that's a good one. Let's go to the next um, one that Mark points us to. Here we go. Look in your chat box there. I'm going to have to slip over to my phone. <clears throat> okay. The screen has gone black here and I can't get it back. So I'm going to have to. Sure. So be let in here. <laughs> the life of Joseph, there is God using suffering to provide salvation. Remember, Joseph's story is a story of suffering. And then exaltation and suffering and exaltation and suffering and exaltation. If you know the whole story of Joseph's life. And then Mark is sending us to Acts chapter 2, verse 23. <coughs> Can you bring me a glass of water, please? <coughs> I got it. There we go. I <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay. I have to move both of those. All right. All right. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. It parallels Joseph's life as far as not necessarily that he did nothing wrong, but he was kind of innocent a few different times and was punished, yet saved the Israelite nation through that. And Jesus is going to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Or in Acts, has already done the same thing. Exactly. Uh, I didn't look at the first Peter passage that's listed there. Has anybody looked at that one yet? Yes. Um... It says, uh, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So we see principles that are carrying across from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Here's the, here's the next one. The Passover. <clears throat> Uh, and Mark talked about this particular phrase, salvation by substitution. In other words, someone in someone else's place. So if you want to look at that one in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. <clears throat> 
Is for even Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us, and for the Israelites, an animal had to die in order to put the blood on the doorposts. Mm -hmm. for the right, and then later on in the in the sacrificial system, and and just take for a moment. I want you to think through is Israel's history and the temple. <clears throat> the temple is destroyed for a, you know a, a seventy year period, but for the most part, the temple was. T Tabernacle Temple was ongoing for uh, fourteen hundred years of time. I guess right. No, it'd be less than that, but close. Yeah, around 1400, 1400 years of time, the temple was operating. How many animals died in that fourteen hundred year time? Thousands. Yeah, millions of animals passing away. And I think this is part of what we miss in, if we're not careful, we, we take forgiveness and substitutionary sacrifice very lightly. It's like we kind of view it as God kind of just kind of goes, oh, okay, go ahead. Not a big deal, you know. Um, but the Old Testament was to teach us the incredible uh, suffering that is required to pay the penalty for a sin. And I think that's the beauty of what the Old Testament still teaches us even now uh, about suffering and substitution, about sacrifice. We just got a couple more minutes. I'm going to throw the rest of them up here. And what I would encourage you to do <coughs> is if you are able Maybe you want to take and just, I think you can, yeah, you can copy those. You still see them? Yeah. Uh, you can copy those and maybe paste those on a, a, a document uh, on a sidebar or in a screen that you can look at the rest of these uh, because we won't have time to quite get to all of them. And, and let's just for a moment just talk about real quickly the tabernacle because this is the one that kind of connected with me the most. In the tabernacle, I, I like the way Mark put it that we're, we're moving back to Eden where Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the evening. And now the children of Israel in the tabernacle are really close to God. It's not that level of intimacy, but it's a lot closer. God is near. And then we're, we know we're going to move to the New Testament. What's the, what's the temple of God now? Us. Us. First of all, uh, the, the temple, we, we, we actually represent a place for the Holy Spirit to dwell. But in a more full sense, particularly the, the incredible sense of the entire presence of the Holy Spirit, it, it's us where two or three are gathered there i am in their midst is what he says it brings a whole new thought process to gathering together as god's people we are we're gathering as his place of dwelling on this earth and no longer is it really distant at all it's actually internal it's uh him living in me him living in you and then him dwelling in us as we gather together to experience God in worship and in worship and in uh, preaching and teaching and hearing his voice and hearing his rules and being challenged in scripture and being uh, healed and being blessed by words. You know, church takes on the gathering of God's people takes on a whole different level of meaning uh, when we connect it back to what it was designed, what it refl what reflects it in the Old Testament, the tabernacle, and and dwelling with God at Eden, I love that picture of what God's doing. So I'm going to throw that with you. Uh, hold on to that, and that leads us back to. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
the question that Mark sent out about the road to Emmaus. If you've got that question, Jesus was walking on the road to Emmaus. There were two guys on the road with him. He begins to teach them about himself, his death, his resurrection. What would he have turned to? And tonight we've been shown all kind of options that Jesus could have pointed to to make sense of who he was and the cross and the resurrection. Now, the first one that strikes me is, of course, is substitutionary death, right? I'm assuming Jesus looked to the law and talked about the death of animals and the death of the perfect sacrifice. I think that's probably where he would have at least started, okay? Any other thoughts? Any, you want to challenge or speak to any one of these that you see in front of you now? So I hope you're getting kind of a, a, an overall picture. we got a long way to go, a lot of ground to cover in two more weeks to get all the way to the book of Revelation. Um, so Mark is going really fast, but that's the intentions of this particular seminar. So once again, give us the incredible overarching view of what God's story is. I do like what Mark said at the beginning about he's the hero of this story, not human beings, not Moses not Joshua. They're supporting role players. We're supporting characters in a story, but God is the hero of this story. Uh, and, and I love the way that is a theistic, really good theistic view of what's going on on this planet. And even the tabernacle representing it's, it's about God dwelling on this earth right now in his people uh, with, with us. Okay. All right. Guys, it's a few minutes after nine. Uh, the Lord be with you. Any questions before we go? Uh, no, not for me. All right. Anyone else? All right. Arlene, we can't hear you. I see your. I see you talking, but we've got no sound. Um, just that the world says we are to be the heroes of our own lives, but Christ <laughs> is actually supposed to be the hero. See, there's a there's a competing story, and that's a humanist story where humans are the center right. of the story, instead of a theistic view where God is the center of the mm -hmm. story. And I like yeah. what Mark said: the more, the closer we are to God, the more human we actually become. I want you to wrestle around with that thought. The more closely we become aligned with God, the more we follow his law, is actually what he was talking about. The more we follow his law, the more human we actually become. In other words, we're more like what we were designed to be. I think there's something really powerful in that for us. Because we've been told, the more independent I become, the more human I actually am. And it's really just the opposite. The more dependent I become on my relationship with God, the more human I actually become, more designed and filling what I was designed to be, a servant of the Most High God, a son of the Most High God, a daughter of the Most High God. I think there is where life is abundant. Okay? Yes. Any other questions? <clears throat> if you need to, anytime, don't feel awkward if you're going, man, you know what? I need to... We're, we're going to try to always hold it. We, we, we appreciate time uh, and that we all have schedules. So if you need to chime in, no, no offense will be taken, but I have no problem if people want to hang a few minutes extra and ask questions. That's also a great thing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Lord thank you. bless you and be with you. Dean, it was great to have you tonight. Ray, it was great to have you tonight. And Carolyn, it was great to have you guys all coming on tonight. Thank you for coming. And uh, the Lord bless you all. See you Man, next Thank week. you. You all as right. well. Bye now. And hey, Bye. just last thing, if you know somebody who wants to join, they can join in late. It's not like a, oh, you know what? You have to join the beginning. We won't care if people show up late. Uh, that is also wonderful. So pass the link on if anybody wants to join up. Okay? Have a great okay. day. All right. Blessings. Bye now. Okay. <clears throat>